college football never seems to let us down, and it seems like week after week, we're getting incredible performances from some of the top countries' teams, and we're also getting a lot of movement in the top 25 with some interesting draft prospects to talk about along the way. And college football didn't let us down with a really fun morning slate with Louisville, Miami that went down to the wire. Indiana makes a statement against Nebraska. Then the afternoon games, one of the big ones, third Saturday in October, Alabama, Tennessee, incredible game that we will be talking about. And then we get the nightcap of Texas and Georgia, where Georgia goes into Austin and pulls off the win to reclaim the top spot in the SEC, very likely. We'll talk about it all. We'll talk about some of the top performances of the weekend in today's stock report. But before we get into it, consider hitting that like and subscribe button. We're doing weekly college football content here on the channel, and I highly recommend checking it out if you do enjoy the content. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon page leave, that I will leave linked down below. I've got almost 500 draft prospects on my draft guide right now, big board. So if you guys do want to get a head start on the competition, I recommend checking that out. But let's talk about who I think had the best performance of the weekend. And it's going to go to Georgia linebacker Jalen Walker. I picked the perfect day to upload the prospect spotlight, didn't I? Jalen Walker was flying around for the Georgia defense and had 11 tackles for three sacks, but it, I mean, I don't have the pressure numbers per PFF yet. He had to have had eight to 10 pressures in this game. Seemed like every other play him and Michael Williams were in the backfield against a really good Texas offensive line. And I think that was the big takeaway from this game. If you are Georgia, Michael Williams was looked to be fully healthy for the first time since week one. And this defense played like it. They were everywhere and Jalen Walker is an absolute freak he's 6'2 244 pounds I saw a tweet it said Jalen Walker's looking like what people were talking about Harold Perkins as and I do agree with that I mean he moves incredibly fluidly he's got really good athleticism the length the size that you all look for the thing I'm going to worry about and I talked about in my prospect spotlight is he good enough in coverage, and does he have pass rush moves to consistently win? He did show that today against Texas, however. He is my number one linebacker, and he jumped up significantly in terms of position on the big board. I think he's a firm first-round grade for me. I had him in the first to second round here coming into the day. He was incredible today, and that Georgia defense looked legit. They looked back. We'll talk all about them in the top 25 segment, but Jalen Walker – Huge win uh, and a huge game for him against Texas. Then we're going to talk about Kobe Bryant. It feels like we haven't talked about a Kansas player in quite a while. And Kobe Bryant's a really fun corner. He plays really physical, really tough. Had two tackles, one tackle for loss, and three interceptions against Houston. Houston has been an absolute uh, disaster this year uh, in the Big 12. So is Kansas, in all honesty. But Kobe Bryant... Really fun player. He's six foot, 175 pounds, and that's really going to be the big concern with him when you look at him on draft day. He's really small for the position, but the tools are there. He's really wiry and quick to the football. He's got the ball skills, as you see here. He's a powerful hitter, and he hits with a ton of aggressiveness. I mean, he could get called for targeting on some of the hits. I, he definitely – plays with that mentality that he wants to hurt somebody. I'm not going to say wants to hurt somebody, but he wants to land a powerful hit. I, I misworded that. But Kobe Bryant's a really good corner, and Kansas hasn't had the season they were expecting. In a corner class that seemingly just continues to get worse and worse each and every week, Savon Ravel's out for the season. Benjamin Morrison's out for the season. Will Johnson's been in and out. Will J Those guys are all first-round picks. You're looking for some depth there in the middle of the class. And I think Kobe Bryant is a day two type of prospect because of his traits, because of his athleticism, and the ball skills here further prove that. And I think he had a really nice day against Houston. Dylan Sampson is a running back that I, I feel like we may have talked about once, but, man, he was incredible today. If you watched that Alabama-Tennessee game, the first half, Tennessee couldn't get anything going on the offensive side of the football. And in the second half, 
they really were able to get it going. They used Dylan Sampson in the run game, and he had himself a day, 26 carries, 139 yards, and two touchdowns. I think my favorite thing about Samson is the power that he runs with. He puts his head down. He picks up extra yardage. And he's a really impressive runner in that regard. You look at some of these other backs, they want to bounce it to the outside. And when he does get out to the outside, he does have the quickness to turn it into a really big play. But Samson also just has the power and he keeps his legs churning and can turn it into more yardage. Really impressive day against an Alabama defensive line that has been pretty solid this season, um, at least up front and defending the run. I thought Samson did a really nice job of fighting for extra yardage. He leads the SEC in touchdowns right now. He's been very productive, and I feel like he's a player that, yes, he has been productive, but I don't think he's getting the recognition nationally that he deserves. He's a guy that I think could get drafted relatively high, maybe a fourth, fifth round pick. Um, I think he's a good back, and I I think he's going to have a really nice career. So, Big win from Dylan Sampson this weekend. Going back to the defensive side of the football is Antoine Powell Ryland from Virginia Tech. I turned on his tape last year, thought there was a chance he might declare. He was getting a little bit of buzz and decided to come back to Virginia Tech for another year. I did an interview with his teammate Aeneas Peebles back in the summer. If you guys want to check that out, the Patreon is the best place to go for that. But Antoine Powell Ryland was a guy that we talked about a few, a little bit in the interview, and he was raving about him, the leadership that he plays with. But he has taken his game up another level this year. He is a little bit undersized for the position, at around 240 pounds, I believe. But he plays aggressive. He's a he's a really powerful player who seems to have really improved in terms of his quickness and his bend around the edge. Twelve tackles, four sacks in this game, four tackles for loss. He is the Virginia Tech player that I decided to highlight today. His teammate, Tootin, the running back, had 260 yards. I want to say three or four touchdowns in this one as well. Virginia Tech had some awesome performances. But I think Antoine Powell Ryland, he's an edge rusher that I think is a day two prospect. He's got really good athletic traits. He plays with power. He does have some pass rush moves he can break out. He's quick with his footwork. And he is producing at a really high rate for this Virginia Tech defensive line. And I think that's been really important for them. This is a Virginia Tech team that if you go and actually look at the games that they played in, this team has been way better than what their record leads you to believe. They pulled off a big win against Boston College. This is a bowl team and a team that I think has been pretty solid all season long. Antoine Powell Ryland had a really awesome week this weekend for the Hokies. Then we're going to talk about Curtis Rourke again, man. Incredible performance. The numbers aren't really going to – We're. I mostly just wanted an excuse to talk about him because he did move up on my draft guide. I had a seventh-round grade on him. Initially, I had an undrafted grade on him. Transfer from Ohio. I didn't really see the traits there. Comes to Indiana. I, I saw some stuff early. I'm like, okay, I think I'd take a flyer on him late in the draft maybe. He is quickly working himself up, and I've got a fifth-round grade on him now. Do I think he's a perfect prospect? No, but he is playing out of his mind right now for Indiana. 17-21, 189 yards, a touchdown, and interception. The timing on some of these throws that he makes, it's absolutely phenomenal. He's got incredible accuracy to all three levels of the field, makes really good decisions. He's not too much of a runner, but he does have athleticism to where if he wants to take off, he can make guys miss in the open field. The throws that I think, I mean, I watched quite a bit of this Indiana game. These back shoulder throws, he throws with incredible timing and touch to put the ball in a spot where only his receivers are going to be able to get. He's a quarterback that I think could have a really nice role at the NFL level. We're going to talk all about this Indiana team here in a little bit because they've been very impressive. But I think Curtis Rourke, he's a really good quarterback. He's got the size. He's got a good arm. And if he can continue to show this accuracy and Indiana can keep winning games, he could sneak into a late day two consideration. I think he's played incredible early on this season for the Hoosiers. He's a big winner again. And the second time he has made my stock reports. Ollie Gordon. We talked a lot about him in the off season. This is a guy that, Everyone had as the presumptive RB1 in this class, and nobody really batted an eye at it. And I kind of pushed back on that narrative. 
coming into the year, I was like, look, I like Ollie Gordon. I think he's a good running back. I don't think he's the number one guy. I had Ashton Genty and I had Quenshaw Judkins ahead of him, as I still do. And Ollie Gordon really came out this season and put up a stinker. I mean, they could not get him going at all. And he finally breaks out against BYU, 16 carries for 107 yards. I want to say he had four receptions for 25 yards, and then he had three total touchdowns. Ollie Gordon's back. He showed the power. He showed that second-level quickness, the power to run over guys. He showed a hurdle in this game. That's what Oklahoma State has needed. This team has been a pretty much a disaster all season long. The offensive line has been up and down. The defense hasn't been amazing. And they've just lost too many games that they should have won. I thought Oklahoma State was going to be in my final top 25. They've been disappointing, and I think Ollie Gordon has been a part of that. He was expected to be the focal point of this offense. Unfortunately, hasn't been able to get it going, but had a big game against a BYU team that, again, we'll get to them in a little bit. And you like to see this from him. And um, hopefully he can continue it going late into the season to help boost his draft stock. But I thought Ollie Gordon had a really nice week. Wanted to get to highlight him a little bit in this stock report. Then Jade Barron, man. I, I was neck and neck between do I talk about Cameron Williams this week or do I talk about Jade Barron in my prospect spotlights? I went with Jade Barron. I could have went with Andrew Makuba as well. But Jade Barron is a really interesting prospect who started his career more as a safety, moved to the slot, and now they've moved him to boundary corner. And he has been absolutely phenomenal picked off Carson back twice in this game on one of the weirdest plays you're ever going to see they called him for pass interference on a horrendous call they overturn it because fans start throwing water bottles on the field they overturn it as the refs get the chance to kind of discuss it Texas gets the ball down in the red zone this is a Texas defensive group that's been really impressive this year and John A. Barron just continues to impress me the ball skills, the quickness with his hips, the speed, the versatility to play really anywhere in that defensive backfield for the Longhorns. And look, I talked about it in my last week's mock. I was like, look, I like Jade Barron. I think he's the only corner that I would consider putting in that first round consideration. I've got Travis Hunter in there, Will Johnson, Savon Ravel, Benjamin Morrison. That's it. People are going to try and throw Denzel Burke in there. I'm not there with him. Jade Barron is the next cornerback in that group for me. I think he's got the size, the versatility, the quickness, the ball skills. It's all there that you look for. And I think he's going to be a really, really good player at the next level. I would take him in the first round. I think he's that good of a corner, that good of a defensive back. And I think a lot of people are sleeping on what he could bring to a team at the next level. So I've got Jade Barron as a big winner of the weekend. Then we're going to talk about another one of my just favorite prospects in this draft class, Nick Emanwari out of South Carolina. I did a prospect spotlight on him last week for the Super Weekend, so be sure to go check that one out if you haven't already. This is a guy that has all the tools you look for. He's got long arms, recruited to play linebacker, and has just been everywhere for South Carolina. Nine total tackles, a tackle for loss. But the ball skills were my big issue with him coming into the season. And he's been everywhere, flying around, making plays. It was huge in that LSU game for them. In this game against Oklahoma, has two interceptions, returns one for a pick six. This is a really good safety. 6'3", 220, somewhere in that range. He's got really good athleticism. I mean, the, his numbers are going to wow you at the draft combine. He is unbelievable in that regard. He's got speed, quickness, tackling ability. This is a guy that I'm not going to say he's a first-round prospect, but he's going to get taken off the board very quickly in the second round. I think he's a top 40 guy in the class for me. Absolutely love what he brings to the table as a defensive back with the versatility and the upside that he provides. And Yeah, I think he is going to be an incredible player, and I think he had just another statement game. Just a long line of these South Carolina guys. It seems like week after week. Talking about Kyle Kennard and, um, and um, oh, what is his name? Uh, Fortune. We talked about those guys last week and Eman Wari this week. I, I love this South Carolina team. Then we're going to talk about Davin Van, a player that we didn't really highlight too much in the offseason. Player that I did have on my initial preseason big board. And look, do I think he's this awesome player that's going to get taken in the first three to four rounds? 
Probably not, but this is a guy that I would put on your draft radars deep down in day three. He's a bit undersized. I think he's six foot. I mean, you can see in the pictures, arms aren't very long, but he's a really good pass rusher. And I think he could be a really nice three tech, maybe a um, a three, four defensive end in certain instances. Six tackles, two sacks, two tackles for loss today against Cal. He was disruptive and he's going to be playing in the NFL. I mean, he's got the tools. He's got the athleticism. Shows some nice burst off the line of scrimmage. He does have, know how to combine pass rush moves together, get to the backfield. And that's what you want to see from your defensive tackles. There's a really, really good interior defensive line class. So there's going to be a lot of guys that I'm going to have ahead of him. But I think Davin Van's a really impressive player that's got the traits to be an interesting uh, talent at the NFL level. Obviously, the arm length, the size is a bit inconsistent up and down and you don't love it, but I still think he's got a role at the NFL level, and I've got him as another winner of the weekend. And then the last winner I wanted to highlight is going to be Gabe Jakus. Now, I know I said that name wrong. I want to say it's Yakis is how it's pronounced. So we're going to go I, We're going to go with that. Either way, I feel like I'm going to get this name wrong, so we'll just call him Gabe. Awesome game from him. This is a Michigan offensive line that's been really bad this season. That's just a Michigan team that's been really bad, quite frankly. And Gabe had a really nice game. 11 tackles, two and a half sacks, two and a half tackles for loss. Ended up making my top 15 edge rushers coming into the season. Now, throughout the season, he has moved down with guys like Donovan Iziaraku, Kyle Kennard, those guys jumping up for me. But I still do like Gabe quite a bit. I mean, this is a guy that I think is pretty raw as a prospect. He's got length and size and power that he rushes with just hasn't really pieced everything together yet, but you, these games are the games that give you hope. He's been really productive for Illinois. He's made big plays and big moments, and he has the athletic traits that you look for. He's big. He's long. He's physical. I think he's going to be a day two pick. I wouldn't be shocked if he's like a third, fourth round guy, and I think he's going to take a couple years to develop, but once he kind of figures out his role at the NFL level, I do think that he's going to be a really, really nice piece because I think the traits are there. He's going to be one of these guys that may be a late bloomer, but I think he's got the upside, and I'm a big fan of what he provides on the defensive side of the football. Then we're going to take a look at the Heisman rankings. As you can see, a little bit of movement there in the middle. And Dylan Gabriel, I do have still at number five. I think Dylan Gabriel is a great quarterback. The Purdue game didn't really move me much. You're playing the worst team in the Big Ten, one of the worst teams in college football right now. You win 35-0. He has a great performance. Don't get me wrong. Still have him at five. I've been really impressed. I, some of the throws he makes are Michael Penix-esque, and I'm not comparing him to Michael Penix. I was a huge Michael Penix guy. Dylan Gabriel is similar in that he's a lefty. He's an older quarterback prospect. He's dealt with the transfer portal. But Dylan Gabriel, he's a little bit more athletic. He's a little bit less accurate and consistent with some of his throws. This year for Oregon, I mean, he was my preseason pick to win the Heisman. Um, he's fallen off for me a little bit, but uh, I'm a big fan of what he does. Um, Curtis Rort, we talked about him. He's jumping up. He does jump Shadur Sanders to get into my top five. Look, Indiana 7-0. This Indiana team has not lost a game yet. And a big part of it's the quarterback situation. You look at this Indiana team too. Guys like Miles Price, Elijah Surratt, like they've got good weapons. Don't get me wrong, but I don't really think that this is like a loaded group for him to be throwing the football to. And he's putting up incredible numbers. It's offense is scoring a ton of points. This is an Indiana team that I think is really good. I've got him at number four in the Heisman race. Then we've got Travis Hunter. He drops the spot. Didn't play the second half against Arizona. Um, ended up getting banged up. Those are the kind of things that are going to end, end up losing you the Heisman in the long run. Travis Hunter is still putting up incredible numbers this season. Colorado, I told you guys coming into the year, this Colorado team had a legitimate chance to win the Big 12. Right now, I do think there's a clear top three. They probably won't be in the Big 12 championship game. But this is a bowl team. This is a team that I think is going to win eight, nine games. It's a really good Colorado football team. And I think Travis Hunter is a big part of that. Obviously, what he does on both sides of the ball, he's the best player in the draft class. Yeah, I think Travis Hunter is still a Heisman candidate. I got him at number three. Uh, Cam Ward at number two. 
just another incredible performance against Louisville through four touchdowns. It's some of the ways that he's winning these games. He just doesn't look phased in the big moments, and that's what excites you about Cam Ward. Pressure's in his face. He does a really nice job of just evading pressure and kind of keeping his eyes upfield, making some throws on a on a string. He's a really impressive quarterback, and he is my number one quarterback at, at the time of recording this. It seems like it changes every week. And then Ashton Genty putting up historic running back numbers. Didn't have a game this week. Don't really see a reason to really – change that he's putting up the best running back numbers we've seen since Barry Sanders this guy's unstoppable he's got everything you look for he is still the Heisman front runner through eight weeks the only team that fell out of the top 25 out of my top 25 um, is Nebraska and Nebraska had a really really rough game losing 56 to 7 Dylan Rayola showed some of the inconsistency still that he has in his game Still a true freshman, not worried about his progression at all. This is a Nebraska team that I do like. It just wasn't their day. They weren't able to stop Colorado, or excuse me, they weren't able to stop Indiana. The Indiana pass pass rush was getting up, uh, getting pressure up front. The secondary was playing well. Nebraska was sitting at number 25, and they have fallen all the way out. So what does the top 25 look like? Well, here is the new and updated top 25 we do have another number one team here. It is going to be Oregon jumping up from number two to number one for me. Beating Ohio State is the best win of the season. They're still undefeated. They still have a really great resume, and that's really what it comes down to. I really favor the two undefeated teams up at the top in Oregon and Penn State. I'm higher on this Penn State team than the consensus. I think this Nittany Lions team is they're fast. They play physical in the trenches, which we expect every year from Penn State. But Drew Aller is playing really good football. Tyler Warren's playing like a sleeper Heisman candidate. There's a lot to really like about Penn State. And I know people aren't going to like me having them at two. But I think Penn State's that good of a football program right now. They have a vibe. They jump up because the number one team did lose. Um, and they were sitting at number three. Uh, Georgia jumps up from number six back up to my number three spot. Georgia played an incredible, incredible game. Offensively, Carson Beck threw three interceptions. It's not ideal. Trevor Etienne had an awesome game, though. He had one of his best games as a as a football player, in all honesty. But the defense really showed you what you felt good about. The pass rush was connecting. Secondaries making plays, pass breakups left and right. And they really made life difficult on Quinn Ewers. So much so that Ewers got benched at the end of the first half for Arch Manning. And we did end up coming back, leading some plays. But we'll just segue this right into talking about Texas. Texas just didn't have their night. Their defense played well. They were creating pressure also. Their secondary played good. The offense just wasn't able to really get it going. They were pretty slow out the gate. Um, didn't really have a good first half. Second half, they got it going a little bit, but it was a little bit too little too late. They are still a top five team, though. I'm not worried about Texas at all. I still think they're probably going to be in the SEC championship game. Ohio State doesn't play this week. They remain at number five. Now, people are going to be upset that I have Miami dropping down to number six. I'll explain. This Miami defense worries me. Louisville has not been a predict particularly explosive offense this year. And uh, they, they had a really easy game against Miami. You look at the last three games for Miami, Virginia Tech, Cal, and Louisville. They've been able to win all three of these games, but they've been too close for comfort. And the defense just has not played up to the standard you would like to see. So I do have them dropping two spots, which I think is fair. I don't think they're better than any of the teams ahead of them right now. But this is a good Miami team that I am a big fan of. Clemson, bit of a scare there early against a good Virginia team, but they're able to pull off the win. Wasn't Kate Klubnick's best performance, but Clemson wins. Then my Tennessee Vols. Huge win against Alabama, the, one of the biggest wins of the year. The offense was pretty slow out the gate, zero points in the first half, but you felt really good about the offense in the second half. The run game started to open up. Nico Yamaliava started to hit some of those deep balls that you were worried about. The deep ball inconsistency has got to get cleaned up. He looks like Joe Milton out there at times, but I, I got Tennessee at number eight. I think that's one of the bigger wins in the SEC, and I think they're right back in the mix as the SEC champions. BYU, I mean, continues to just dominate. 
monster win last night against, or yeah, against uh, Oklahoma State. Um, and there's a really good Cougars team that is undefeated. They're playing excellent football right now. The defense is playing well. The offense is explosive. I mean, they've got one of the best resumes of college football. They beat Oklahoma State. They beat Kansas State. They beat Arizona. They have beat up on some really good football programs. And I think they're a top 10 team right now. I got them at number nine. Iowa State, bit of a scare against UCF, but Rocco Beck leads them down the field for a game-winning drive, and they get the win. Notre Dame beats Georgia Tech. They stay the same. Texas A&M beats Mississippi State. They stay the same. LSU beating Arkansas. Just jump up one spot for me. That LSU-Texas A&M game is going to be a ton of fun next week. Super excited for that. Wasn't the greatest game from Garrett Nussmeyer, um, but it was a good game from Caden Durham, the true freshman running back sensation who's been incredible for them. Uh, I was impressed by that. Indiana jumps up two spots for me, beating Nebraska. And it's not that I, I wanted to rank Indiana in the top 10. I really, really did. Iowa State, after that scare, I thought about dropping them, but I don't really see a reason to drop them. I still think they're a top 10 team. They've been awesome this year. Indiana at number 14, I think, is very fair and reasonable. So I'm going to leave them where they're at. And then we've got uh, Ole Miss. Didn't play today. You could argue they should be lower than Alabama. I get it. We'll talk about Alabama here in a second, but they stayed the same for me. Kansas State jumps up one spot mostly – because, well, Indiana moved up. And I think Kansas State's a little bit better right now than Alabama, who we're going to talk about. Alabama is now two losses on the season. They've got LSU in a couple of weeks. I'm starting to get a little bit worried about the Crimson Tide. And I do think LSU is going to beat them. Uh, let me say that right now. Um, this Alabama defense is bad. I mean, I talked about LT Overton. He had a sack today. Good for him. I just don't think this defense is that good. They're not able to consistently create pressure. The secondary has just got their ups and downs. And Jalen Milrow was horrible today. I mean, a capital H, horrible. Just sailing receivers left and right. Just bad decision-making, forcing the ball in the tight windows. And those are the moments that worry you about Jalen Milrow. We'll see if he's able to bounce back. But that's two losses on the season. I think their college football playoff hopes are – I'm pretty much dead now. I I think so. I mean, we'll see how the rest of the season goes, but I, I don't think they're a playoff team, especially if they lose to LSU. So I've got Alabama dropping down from number eight all the way down to number 17. Boise State didn't play, but they're playing like the best group of five team, arguably. I got them staying. Missouri, really good. And I mean, great stuff from Brady Cook. Gets hurt, has an MRI, comes back in the game, ends up leading them to beat Auburn. You love to see it, but it's not a game that moves me with this Mizzou team. Pitt, they stay the same after having a bye week. Really like this Pitt team. I think they could be a sneaky contender in the ACC. Uh, SMU's playing good football. They dominate Stanford. Um, Army and Navy, I mean, put these teams in any order you want. That Navy-Notre Dame game is must-see TV, and I hope college game day goes down to that one because the atmosphere is going to be intense. Both of these teams are undefeated right now, and it's super exciting to see. The run game has been incredible. Illinois stays the same after beating Michigan. I mean, I don't think that's a great win for anybody. I think Michigan is really terrible, but a win's a win. Illinois is a team I'm higher on the consensus. And then Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt's in my top 25. They're going to finish it out. They beat Ball State, but they beat Alabama. They beat Kentucky. They've got some good wins on their SEC resume, and they are no longer the pushovers in the SEC. And that's going to do it for me in this one. So let me know what you guys think. What did you guys agree with? What did you disagree with? Do you agree with the top 25? would love to hear your thoughts and opinions down below. Leave a like, subscribe if you are new, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.